So hey, if there's other architects out there who want to get published and want to reach out to the media, do you have any suggestions for them since you've been through that process besides what we already talked about in terms of just getting noticed and getting seen? You have to do it. This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Welcome back, Architect Nation. This is Enoch, and Business of Architecture is the show where we discuss running a great practice so you can quit worrying about paying the bills and focus instead on creating great architecture and leaving a lasting legacy. In 1968, Andy Warhol famously said that in the future, everyone will be world famous for 15 minutes, or as is said in the UK, nine days wonder. Now, I just mentioned that because I found that on Wikipedia and I thought it would make me sound really smart. So for those of you across the pond over there in the beautiful Emerald Isle, you'll have to tell me whether that is truly a saying or whether Wikipedia is full of it. So the question is, what will you do with your 15 minutes? Today's guest had fame for not only 15 minutes, but several months. His name is Hank Butita, and for his master's in architecture thesis at the University of Minnesota, he converted an old school bus into a chic, modern living space. You can find out more about his project at his website, hankboughtabus.com, where Hank and his, t- and his two partners, Justin Evadon and Vince Butita, have documented their road trip with pictures and photographs and videos. What originally attracted me to this story was not only the uniqueness of the project, but also the way they have embraced social media and online tools to share their experiment. This is a story that truly went viral. I highly recommend you visit hankboughtabus.com just to feast your eyes on the amazing documentary-style photographs. In the first half of our conversation, we discuss why Hank built a bus for his thesis, the importance of prototyping in the architectural process, and how you can harness your hour in the spotlight. Here's the show. So let, let's take it back, first of all, and let's tell people exactly how you decided to do a bus conversion as your master's thesis project. Oh, yeah. So um, this has actually been rolling around in my head for quite a while. Um, so a handful of – it's kind of a combination of two things coming together, you know, that, that perfect storm. Uh, one side of the story is that uh, my grandfather owns 80 acres of wooded land in, the, in Wisconsin – and uh, my friends and I have started using that land over the past few years. And um, uh, we talked about, like, um, putting a cabin on the land so that we had something permanent that kept us going back there, made sure we stayed in contact and were really appreciating this resource. And we looked into it, and it's, it wasn't possible for us to build under six or 800 square feet at, and follow the building code. And it required all kinds of permits, and we realized we just couldn't build, uh, we couldn't afford to build a cabin, and it was much larger than we wanted anyway. We were hoping to do a micro cabin. So wait, there, what, tell me about the codes that didn't allow you. I've never heard of a, ma- a minimum size. What's that all about? Um, there were, it, it was basically a number of requirements that added up to a certain amount of square footage. It's been a couple of years since I looked at it, but from what I remember, you had to have a, a, a bathroom a bedroom, a and like a living area, and each of them had a minimum square footage. And I I, I called the uh, the office in that county, and they told me you won't be able to build. I asked if like if it's under a hundred square feet because I'd read some places online say if you build it under a hundred square feet, you don't need any permits. And that's a, that's kind of skirting the law in one way, um, but you're not allowed to occupy those. And so I asked if I was going to build um, something that was occupiable. Uh, would it have to be a certain size? And they told me minimum 600 square feet, six or 800. And it, it depends on the county, but I think a lot of places have minimum square footages. And that's that's a lot of the reason why um, the tiny house movement popped up, because there are so many building codes that don't allow you to build under square footage. So the best way around it is to be on wheels and registered as a vehicle. It's why trailer parks exist, um, because they're they're not registered. In, they're not homes on foundations are not buildings they're they're registered as vehicles um in a weird way so uh that was the best option for us it was um it was going to let us build as small as we wanted without um without needing permits wasn't going to change the tax structure of the land and it was going to give us kind of a pre-made shell to work with which is really interesting and the possibility 
if it wasn't a trailer, if it was a vehicle, to like move itself to the land, which is really appealing. Nice. So I'm going to pause right here, and I'm just yeah, going to interject go and say, you know, you came with the bus. What other things did you consider along that process? So, okay, the, the cabin's out. What are other alternatives? Take me through that process of just figuring out how you came up with that solution. Um, well, we, we knew if it wasn't going to be a cabin, if we wanted a structure that we could inhabit on there, it was going to have to be an RV of some sort. But it was there were a lot of options in that category. It could be a used trailer on Craigslist that we could – we found a couple for like under a thousand dollars. Junky old trailers that already got a couple bunk beds and a little kitchenette. Um, and we looked at those, but we weren't we weren't thrilled with the option. We kind of kept putting off the decision. Um, the big change actually happened this last winter. Um, one of us was cruising Craigslist in the Minneapolis area and stumbled across what it looked like an old prison bus. <laughs> this uh, like fifties, sixties bus that was black and white with a red light on top. And someone had ripped out the interior, put in a couple of bunk beds, a dining table, and some chairs. And it was, like, big enough and had this really cool aesthetic, and it was cheap. The guy was listing it for under $2,000. And we thought, you know what? We could put in the cash and put this on the land, and it'll be a great head start. Um, but by the time we put our cash together uh, and approached the guy, he decided not to sell. And I was, like, I was crushed at this point. I'm, like, I'm ready to own a bus. <laughs> yeah. I have already made this, like, commitment to myself. I was ready to take this leap, um, and that was really coincidental timing. Um, when when that interaction happened, it was about uh, a week or two before my final semester of architecture school was supposed to start. Um, I had always been interested in doing a built object for my thesis. Um, I just didn't know what it was going to be or how I was going to do it. I didn't really have a focus. Um, the studio I was in, the way our thesis was set up, um, there are four studio options each one with an instructor leading it, and that instructor kind of creates a theme that, like, all the projects are supposed to relate to in some fashion. Uh, my instructor, Adam Marcus, the theme for the studio he established was uh, one-to-one one -to -one prototyping. So he was already encouraging us to work at full scale um, with our projects, and I said, okay, let's take it a step further. And I, I showed him a picture of the bus and said, what do you think? And he's like, you're crazy. Go for it. So it was just kind of... Um, a couple of things happening at the right time and feeling impulsive enough to to kind of make a move. Um, and so really when I made the decision to buy the bus, I didn't know exactly what was going to happen with it. I, I knew I, I wanted a cabin for myself, and it was really a self-centered decision. I, I thought maybe I'll get credit for it. I'm never going to find the time to do this kind of project if I'm not also justifying it some other way. You know, I, because I was getting a – because I was making my thesis, I could consider it my job and dedicate the kind of time to it that I never would otherwise. So um, kind of got lucky in that sense. Now, obviously with the bus, there's some – it's an interesting design problem because it's a very structured – I mean, a bus is a bus, right? I mean, it's a box. Yeah. There's, there's not a whole lot of flexibility unless you want to alter the exterior. I mean, it has right. to be – it has to be able to drive on the road if you want to travel. So how did that affect the design process, having that shell that you were forced to build within? Tell me about that process. It was, it was fantastic for me because I, I struggle most with a blank canvas. I love constraints. It's, it gives me something really to respond to. Um, it's like if, if you don't have a question to answer, like I, I don't know, where do you start talking about? Yeah. Um, and so uh, it and, and and also the the length of the semester was was helpful in a way. It was a very determined point that I had to reach. I couldn't sit around um, kind of sketching ideas all day and say, okay, tomorrow I'll start, I'll start building. It was really critical that I started moving on multiple fronts at the same time. So um, in that first week, I ripped out all the seats, pulled up the floor, and started sketching rough schematics, kind of rough layouts of how it would work. And just uh, the deeper I got into the bus structure, kind of stripping it clean and, and getting it prepped for build-out, I learned the mechanics of the bus. I learned the structure of it. I learned where my mounting points were going to be. I'm like, oh, this is really how the bus frame works. And um, this is, if I'm going to attach something to the wall, if I'm going to attach furniture, this is where it has to be. And, like, as you're pulling off um, panels that are, you know, are not going to be part of the final process, you're like, oh, well, this is where I could run. You know, this is where they ran an electrical chase, so here's an opportunity for me to do it as well. Here's a mount, here's a place where they mounted. And so it was this fantastic chance to, like, um, while I was still moving ahead conceptually, I had 
I was um, I was really digging into the kind of the nitty gritty of of the bus and and able to build off of that. One of the things I love about a school bus compared to like a coach bus or um, or any other type of vehicle I would have converted um, was the modularity of the windows. It really made a lot of decisions easy for me. Um, it 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 gave me this kind of defined unit that I could repeat along the way, and um, the simplicity of the shell made it very easy to to um, build within. You know, a lot of these like I look at I look at all kinds of buses now and think, how would I convert this? <laughs> it's just like the way my brain's been working for the last few months. But um, there are a lot of complicated, funny, goofy shaped windows and custom plastic panels and stuff like that, which would be very hard to kind of for, for me to work with. Whereas, and even airstreams, you know, those curved interiors, I think about all those strange shaped panels. With the school bus, everything was rectangular except for, um, except for the ceiling, which was a simple arc, and really the part that covers it is a rectangle as well, just flexed into place. And so it took me a while to develop that system. There were a couple of prototypes. I would build one bay out to see how I could potentially build that shell, and it took a couple of tries, but once I found that system, it was really rapid, like duplicating that down along the bus. And so um, I forget exactly where that question started. <laughs> <laughs> but well, uh, yeah, that process of, of deciding. No, I think, you, I think you nailed it. And it was the question about the design constraints of the bus. And yeah. then you mentioned the modularity, how it's, and I'm looking at the pictures now, how there's that, that defined module. Uh, tell us about some of the design innovations that you came up with. Give us a little sneak peek at the discoveries you made in addition to what you already mentioned. Uh, my favorite innovation was not even my idea, but I think that's that's important. Like, they're not all going to be your ideas. The trick is kind of sorting out which ones come together to be the right ones. Um, one of the major drawbacks of the, a lot of the conversions I saw from the research I did online, you know, uh, figuring out what other people had done, one of the things that really – that people were missing out on was the opportunity of the, the windows. Um, school buses come with these – these windows all along the side that provide fantastic natural light, panoramic views, and um, so many conversions cover up those windows uh, because of issues with privacy and issues with insulation. And I wasn't ready to compromise those windows. I was really interested in, um, how do I say this, um, taking advantage of the embodied energy of the windows. If I didn't have to rip them out and put something else in, I was going to keep them. That saves me time. I'm on a budget. You know, I'm on a time budget and a, and a monetary budget. If I can leave something, I will. So um, the trick was to create a panel that allowed for both privacy and insulation, um, and, but also didn't entirely kill the natural light. So what ended up happening, each window bay has a translucent insulation panel that slides down into the wall. And it has a, um, a metal angle as a top handle, essentially, that when you pull up, snaps to magnets in the top of the window uh, panel, in the top of the window bay. So um, you can close off the entire bus uh, so that it's, it's private, but you're still letting light in, and it still provides a bit of insulation. I used, um, you know those, uh, that kind of corrugated plastic that they use for political signs? Yeah. So yeah. It's that same material, but it's translucent. I just got it online at a you know a sign, like a for a, a website that sells plastic material for signage, and um, I stacked four or five layers together and made a, a sandwich panel. And so you know with that that it's kind of like the the official what would you call it, um, translucent, like the the corrugated uh, what is it. Why am I blanking the name of it? It's that plastic. It's not acrylic. It's, it's well, it's polycarb. Those um, you. yeah, those uh, polycarbonate, those uh, multi-layer polycarbonate panels. Um, it's kind of like that, but instead of buying the official thing, I just sandwiched them together myself. So kind of a make your own. Yeah, absolutely. And it was because of the size of the windows, I was able to get two by two sheets, which were cheap to buy and ship. Um, and you know, if I had bought polycarb, I priced it out. It would have been multi-wall polycarbonate. It would have cost me like $2,000 to do all the windows on the bus. And with the sign material, I was able to do it for, I think, $400. Um, and if you ever and, want to go into politics, you have ready-made signage. Yeah, I've got, I've got lots of left. You've got a, lots of square footage. Um, 
but just that one, just that one, I hate to call it an innovation, but just that one design decision really opened up the entire bus. It allows it to feel much less claustrophobic um, and, and provides for fantastic views while still meeting the requirements of some insulation, some privacy. The insulation I'll give you, I'll grant you, is, is not as good as it would be if you filled the cavity with like um, p rigid pink foam or something like that. But I don't plan on living it through, in it through the winter at most maybe short weekends in it. So I'm, I'm willing to bundle up <laughs> sure. if that's what it takes to, sure. to maintain the windows. Um, the, other, the other design decision that isn't completely an innovation but is critical and, and not terribly common was the decision to not have any walls dividing the space and no built structure above the bottom of the window height. Um, making that decision allowed it to stay visually entirely open so that even when you're sitting, you have clearer views all the way along. 200, 225 square feet can get really cramped really quick, and it's amazing how many people you can fit in this space before it starts to feel, um, before you start to feel, you know, your personal space is being invaded or cramped. Um, Especially we, for a college student, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the first few days on the bus of the trip, privacy, it felt weird not having privacy, but by the end of the trip, it wasn't an issue. It was just part of everyday life. You knew you didn't have privacy, and that was that. Um, but for the last 10 days of the trip, we had um, six people on the bus, living on the bus for, for, for a week and a half, and it was surprisingly comfortable. You know, we, weren't, we were never really in each other's way. The biggest obstacle was possibly at night we would pull out some of the, um, the beds to sleep across, and then whoever got up first in the morning might have to climb over, but that was it. Awesome. So, and how about a shower? Does it have a shower? I'm just curious. Does not have a shower. The original plans, I had one penciled in, but um, wasn't enough time or the resources at the end of the semester, so I nixed that uh, for, for presentation. And so far, it hasn't been necessary. Um, it's something that, you know, certainly if someone were planning on living in a situation like this, yeah, you'd need a shower, and, and there's a way to do it, but um, the, the specific bus I've got, it's a it's it's average height the ceiling inside for a school bus, um, which is once I've got the floor and ceiling in it's about six foot even, and a lot of my friends who are going to be using this regularly with me are over six foot and I don't know if they could shower comfortably anyway in the space. It is possible to get taller buses, but they're less common. One wasn't available when I was shopping for mine in that one week, so um, it's possible to, but it's there are some restrictions. Um, I looked at, you know, maybe you make a seat and you shower while you shower while sitting down. That's been done, but right now I'm not desperate, so it's it's kind of a future project. Sure, sure, awesome. Yep. Well, you got you got a lot. You got a massive amount of media coverage with this. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the lessons that you learned. First of all, about getting that media coverage. T tell me about that, about your experience. Um. Document everything. <laughs> for those first few days, uh, we just kind of let things slide. We were like, oh, sure, respond to this person, send that off, and, and don't follow up on it. Um, and we realized sometime uh, at the end of that first week, like, you know, we want to be reaching these people again. Um, why do we not have a master list of all the contacts we've established? So we had to dig back through a lot of emails to go find it. Um, also, if you have if you have a website or, or social media or um, – you know, an email list that you want people, you want to be capturing people with, make sure to share that with the media outlets. You know, um, make sure to make it very easy for them to put a link to your website, a link to your Facebook page, because we missed, we got a, a lot of traffic uh, over, I think it was a two or three day period where we had a couple hundred thousand visitors and we did not have an email list established or, <laughs> or a Facebook page. And so it was great that people saw our stuff, but there were, a lot of people who we probably could have captured to contact later that we missed out on. So um, I, I get a, you, you often hear the advice, like, don't wait till you're completely ready to release a product. You know, sometimes you just have to go and put it out there. And I agree with that. You know, we released the blog before it was finished or completely ready. But I would really recommend having a way to capture people, to hold on to them, because you're going to want to reach them again in a future project. I, like... It was fantastic to get all this attention, and I, now I have little, um, I wouldn't call it nightmares, but little panic attacks or something where I'm like, I'm never going to get this kind of attention again. Um, but at the same time, 
I'm totally okay with that. It's also made me realize that that's not what I want out of life. Like, um, I, I'm, I feel really lucky that I, I was able to have this one project get spread so far, but it's, it hasn't fulfilled me. You know what I mean? I still have these goals and ambitions. I don't want to just live off the popularity of this one thing. So it saved me from striving towards that. I'm no longer working towards, like, I need to have something that goes viral and gets published in Arc Daily. No, I, I did that. I lived it. And it's not, it's, it's fun for a few days, but it's, it's not going to make me happy the rest of my life. So it's letting me focus on capitalizing on the attention I have gotten and using it to work towards the things I do want, which is, which is great, but overwhelming <laughs> to have so many options, opportunities that need to be followed up on. Okay. So the two takeaways that I have from that were number yeah. one, make sure you have a master list. Yeah. Right, of people who contact you and people who you're reaching out to. And number two is have a way to capture visitors to your website, for instance, either through a Facebook page or through a email email capture form. It's 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 so surprising. Like sometimes I feel like I don't know why you guys are asking me questions. I don't know what I have to offer, but there are people who want this information, who want to follow up and see your next project. Give them a way to do it. <laughs> Let these people be your fans, you know? Awesome. Just reduce the friction, right? <laughs> So, hey, if there's other architects out there who want to get published and want to reach out to the media, do you have any suggestions for them since you've been through that process besides what we already talked about in terms of just getting noticed and getting seen? You have to do it. You, I'm, maybe it's because I'm not very good at rendering, and that's why I'm biased, but renderings don't capture anyone's attention these days. Um, you, have to, you have to make something. You have to complete a project. You have to go beyond what your coursework is asking you to do and um, and produce something. And I think that's really the only way to get noticed. I had the chance to be a TA for the last uh, two years of my of my uh, graduate program. And, you know, that that's what I had to tell my students. They're like, how do you get an internship? And I said, you know, it's fine to have good grades and decent projects, but you have to do something beyond your coursework to get noticed. And um, even if it's taking, <laughs> bless you, even if it's taking a course project and, moving beyond what was asked of you in class. Um, the reason, part of the way I got my start making making things was uh, I had a course project where an instructor gave us a geometry and said, do something with it, anything. Didn't even have to be a building. I was frustrated with the geometry. I didn't think it was great for architecture, but I said this would make some really beautiful furniture. So I made a dining table. And then friends of mine said, oh, you made that table. Would you make us a table? Okay, yeah, I'll make a table. I've got no experience doing this. But if you if you take that first step, you've already done so much more than everyone else. You know, and someone someone's going to notice it. So um, that's about all I can say is, like, do something. My favorite, um, and this is a bit of a tangent, my favorite example of, of renderings being kind of too popular these days and, and not something that we should rely on too heavily. There was a project recently you probably saw or heard of I think it was called Mark's House in Flint, Michigan, and it was a, a project um, where basically uh, the winner of the competition would be awarded $25,000 to build a pavilion in this square, and the rendering was this really gorgeous, um, completely reflective house shape, house form that was kind of floating, elevated in a, in a square, and it really cast these fantastic reflections and kind of almost disappeared in midair. Won the competition, couldn't build it for $25,000, ended up going like either double or triple budget, something like that. And then the reflective coating ended up being like wrinkly mylar. And so it looks like a tinfoil house sitting in the middle of a square, and it's become a joke. And it's because architects rely too heavily on renderings to communicate an idea and don't really understand how it comes together. And I think that's why um, it's why it becomes so valuable to make things, to demonstrate you're capable of of bringing your ideas into the real world because it's so dangerous to have an idea that you're not sure is proven or can, can or uh, have an idea that you're not sure you can complete. I don't know how to finish that sentence. Okay. <laughs> well, you, you gave the excellent example about renderings and how you do, yeah. you like the one-on-one -on -one prototyping and that was your master's yeah. thesis that you did. Tell me some takeaways about the one-on-one -on -one prototyping and how that's going to influence your future career. I, it's, the more I get into making, the more I'm fascinated with detailing and, and the way that, that objects come together 
I can't right now. It's a, it's a little crippling almost. I need to work with other people to kind of get me past this. But I have trouble designing things that I couldn't build myself. And I, I kind of I get into a mindset of what the capability of the material is and work within that. And I think it's, it's, it's my strength and it's my weakness. I need sometimes people to push me past like, no, this really is possible um, just because you can't do it with your own two hands. Um, but I, I kind of want to be that counterpoint to someone else's, you know, uh, overly conceptual view. Um, I'll never be able to send out drawings for a project without being comfortable that I know how they work mechanically. Um, because if, if say I send out drawings and expect someone else to figure it out, there's no guarantee that they're going to understand kind of the essence of the design, what you're trying to capture, and they could completely compromise your intentions. And you end up with kind of really haphazard or flawed projects because maybe I just um, put too much importance on detailing, but I think things can be solved in ways that are really inelegant and, and end up compromising the design. Like, uh, who was it? I'm going to blank his name. Was it Nice? Did he do IIT? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Where he, he there's some quote of his if, to the effect of, I hate, um, you know, uh, the utilities, the, um, the duct work, or what did it, I can't remember the way he phrased it. But he said, if I don't address it, then it's going to ruin my design. You know, like if I am not considered about where these things are routed and how they're sent there, then it's then someone else is going to make that decision and ruin it. Um, and that's kind of my approach. I have to understand how all these things come together because if I don't, someone else will make the decision and compromise the design. Yeah, I think I finally got there. <laughs> it was a roundabout way of saying it. Awesome, awesome. So what's what's to the future, Hank? What are you looking at now? Next, what's up next? Yesterday, I spent the day wandering around Craigslist um, looking for cheap warehouse space in the cities. Uh, and I actually went and looked at a couple of places. There was one that was too too cheap to be real, right? Like, this is clearly a bad idea. There shouldn't be this low. Um, <laughs> but, but now I can't get it out of my head, and I started drawing up ideas. I am desperate to um, to move into a warehouse space to really establish shop and start working collaboratively with other designers. Um, I've been lucky enough to um, to have some projects start floating my way, some of them small local projects, um, you know, cutting out parts on a CNC machine, others kind of projects on a national scale, some architectural ones. Um, there's a guy who's trusting, a, a guy out in California who's, who's trusting me to, um, to start designing a, a cabin for him which is a little bit overwhelming, you know, for my position, but a fantastic opportunity. And I don't think I could tackle that by myself, but I have people I work with who I know together we can, we can accomplish this. Um, and so really it's, how do I say this? I want to be an architect, but I don't know if I'm ever going to be a licensed architect. And I, that doesn't matter to me in my head um, because I know I'm going to be involved with design and buildings and the trick is kind of seeing if I can do it my own way from my own uh, approach. I'm, I'm resistant, as poor as I am, as broke as I am, I'm really resistant to getting an office job right now because I know there's a good chance I'll become complacent. I'll get dependent on a paycheck and um, never set out and do my own thing. I think right now I'm used to being poor. I'm happy with being poor. And uh, this is my chance to kind of capitalize on these opportunities and start a practice that is maybe less conventional. Um, there are some practices I'd love to emulate that are you know, out in New York or, or LA uh, that are really involved with digital fabrication and making, but um, there's a bit of a void in Minneapolis. And I think there's enough design happening in the cities. There are enough projects happening. I have connections to enough firms who are doing projects that uh, I think it's entirely possible to start a practice that has an emphasis on on digital fabrication and and construction, even um, my personal goal is to have a shop that that kind of bridges that boundary between design and construction. Maybe we're not the lead designer on a project. Maybe we're given an idea, and we just have to solve how it happens, and then we help. You know, maybe we build the first prototype. Maybe we build out the whole whole space. I don't know, but um, I'm really I'm desperate to find a way to bridge 
uh, that kind of the conceptual and the practical, the design and the making, um, and and hopefully act as a kind of a translator between, you know, the architects who maybe don't have great communication with contractors. There are yeah. a lot of options. Who knows how it happens? Awesome. What what are some firms out there that you're looking at that are doing that, that are merging the hands-on um, creation and making? I think there was one of them uh, out east. Their name was actually Make, <laughs> which is pretty obvious. And I was reading an article about them. They were, um, I don't know, they had like a 10,000-square-foot warehouse in Red Hook. <laughs> and I'm like, I have no idea how you afford that, but it just sounds like a playground. You know, to stock it with a couple of CNC machines and 3D printers and just start producing. I would love that. So um, who else? I'm terrible with names and I, I actually, I'm kind of ignorant on architectural, architecture culturally, I guess you could say. I've got friends who read the architecture blogs religiously and I say, hey, do you remember that project? And they tell me, yeah, it was built here by these guys. And I use them as those resources. I, I get kind of more um, caught up in my own projects than I do in other people's, which is possibly a little self-centered. But um, instead of instead of digging around the Internet looking at uh, pictures of architecture, I dig around the Internet looking at, um, you know, which propane heater I'm going to install on the bus, you know, researching the best nice. options for that, or nice. looking at, like, warehouse spaces and how you convert this. And I'm... I just get so embedded in my own projects that I, I stop. I forget to look at other people. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. Well, I know. So you mentioned Make Architects. They're in the UK, I believe. Okay. And then there's another one, Made Shop, which is interesting. You might want to check that one out. It's Made okay. Shop. It's MadeShop.com. And then I don't know if you've heard of Build LLC. They're out out east, out he, I mean, out west, out here, and up in Seattle. I need one of those really straightforward names that just says what I do, right? Like cut. Yeah. Or assemble, or <laughs> yeah, I just build stuff, man. I make stuff. <laughs> and that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can raise your fees, land the projects you love to work on, and get the time in your day back, join the members only Business of Architecture Insider list for free by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash free. Enter your best email address there and I will send you instant access to free resources including my book, Social Media for Architects. If you'd like to discuss a thought or insight from today's show, visit businessofarchitecture.com slash podcast. On that page, you'll also find my notes from today's show and the action items I took away from our conversation. Until next week, keep rocking and go conquer the world. views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the hosts and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help architects conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5. Do it anyway.